Ellen Kohler, uh, who's the Director of Applied Research and Programs at the Water Center at Penn. Uh, I'm just going to do a very brief, um, wait a minute, I thought I had this, there you go, <laughs> a brief overview of our organizations uh, before we kick off. We're also going to do a quick poll so we can find out who's in the room. Um, PEC, we're a nonprofit environmental statewide organization. We were founded in 1970. We have offices in Pittsburgh, Luzerne, up in the northeastern part of the state, State College, and Philadelphia, where both Paul and I uh, work from. Uh, we work across several different program areas. Uh, for the water program, uh, we work with many, many private and nonprofit and governmental partners to facilitate implementation of stormwater control measures that provide the dual function of managing water volume and improving water quality. Uh, we really encourage nature-based approaches that include vegetative components that help slow and filter water. And um, we, we really love to connect communities to technical resources that needed to design, implement, and maintain this infrastructure. <clears throat> so this is very much an, in align with work that we try to do to encourage um, financing, for all kinds of financing options for stormwater management, which, we, which we're gonna be talking about this morning. Uh, just a little bit about the Water Center at Penn. It supports communities in meeting their critical water challenges by identifying solutions that are resilient and sustainable, consider both natural and built water systems, and are based on equitable principles that reflect community voices. The center has seven staff members currently working on 15 projects at the national, regional, and local scale, mostly focused in the Mid-Atlantic and the Great Lakes. Uh, the center partners with colleagues at Penn, at other academic institutions, at conservation organizations, and at community groups to bring a full range of knowledge and expertise to this work. And so, uh, again, you'll be hearing from Ellen shortly. Uh, I'll, I'll just kick us off this morning with a very quick poll. Um, I think that, that Brian will be, will be asking uh, uh, the folks that are participating this morning. Brian, can you, can you do that while I have my presentation up? There it is. So we just wanted to know your, your uh, role if you are with the municipality. Can everybody see the poll? I I'm, 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 just wanna make sure. Okay, great. Okay, I'm, all, I'm only seeing the, the one question. Okay, Brian, just let me know when you feel we should, uh, I'm not seeing any of the results, so you'll have to, you'll have to help me out here. <laughs> Fantastic. Can you see yep, yep, I can see it. Thank you. Thanks, thanks everyone for, uh, for uh, uh, participating. Great. We have like a really nice uh, sort of diversity of folks uh, from the different municipalities. Um, this is really helpful for us as well. And I do want to encourage you as we go through our presentation, if you have questions or we, we mistakenly uh, throw out an acronym that you don't understand, just please ask it in the chat and we'll, we'll make sure to get, get to that. But thank you for the poll. And uh, I'm going to go ahead and get started with um, just reviewing our objectives this morning for our presentation. We're going to review basically three different things, why we need stormwater management, <clears throat> Ellen's really going to cover the various ways to finance stormwater management, and then Paul and I will be talking specifically about uh, stormwater fees as one of those uh, options that, that Ellen will be reviewing this morning. Just to begin, um, I probably don't need to talk, spend too much time about why we need stormwater management. Just to say, <clears throat> we know that um, unmanaged stormwater causes uh, a lot of diff difficulties and problems. Um, common issues, of course, is that uh, you know, when you get too much water coming in too quickly, you get lots of flooding issues, uh, higher potential for pollutants enter entering our streams and, re and, and creeks in our regions, and uh, just lots of potential for not only infrastructure, but property damage as well. So it's a, it's a big issue in our region here uh, due to a lot of development occurring before that we actually had stormwater management as a requirement. Just sort of honing in uh, here in the, in the Brandywine Christina watershed, uh, again, this I'm sure is very familiar to you. And of course, we want to thank our uh, thank uh, our, our friends at the uh, uh, in Chester County for this information. Uh, it's one, being one of the fastest growing counties. There's lots of increased imperviousness. You can see here uh, the the 
this showing the relationship between impaired streams and, and, and those that are supporting uh, aquatic life. Again, I, I, don't, I don't think this is kind of new, but we did want to emphasize that we are in regions that have issues with impaired waterways, uh, especially from uh, uh, stormwater runoff, uh, non-point source uh, uh, sources. So uh, just wanted to remind you about that. Uh, and I think the other sort of elephant in the room these days is understanding what's happening sort of from the climate perspective. Uh, <clears throat> I wanna thank the fr our, our friends at Pima for this particular slide. Uh, and you can see that across the Northeastern part of the United States, we're seeing uh, lots of increases in heavy rain events. Even though our average annual rainfall might not be moving up, the number of uh, intense storms is becoming more frequent. So we're getting a lot of this rain, but it's coming in these very um, uh, high intensity, uh, frequent storms. So uh, it's, it's an issue with respect to existing infrastructure and um, how what type of stormwater management uh, we, we have. So I just wanted to share this with you um, when we think about uh, what we would like to encourage in terms of stormwater management. Uh, just talking a little bit about some, something right here in, 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 in your watershed, uh, we have some uh, interesting data from, from Hurricane Ida. Again, thank, thank you for uh, Chester County Water Resources Authority for this information. What we wanted to point out in, in terms of this, now we know this is a hurricane condition that's a little different, but if you look at the variability and how the uh, creek uh, responded and how, how even in a storm like this, it can be very different across different parts of the watershed in terms of uh, the, the amount of rainfall that occurred. So just something we wanted to also point out. Uh, again, something I'm sure you're familiar with, uh, stormwater challenges, especially on the municipal level. Again, just talked about those changing weather patterns. Um, again, this sort of elevated chance for pollution to enter our streams. Uh, a lot of our municipalities may have older outdated infrastructure um, and some lack any stormwater management infrastructure because they were developed well before we had these kinds of regulations. Um, the different types of stormwater infrastructure also can lead to higher and different maintenance needs, especially if you have older uh, uh, infrastructure. It's a big responsibility for our municipalities, uh, not only because there's, there's federal and state regulatory drivers, but because all of the, sort of the land use decisions that impact uh, our, our, our waterways are, are made at that local level. And of course, the, the big issue always is around, uh, you know, how do you fund all this and how do we um, make sure that we have resilient infrastructure uh, that will take us into the future. So that's where I'm going to pivot right now and um, ask my, my, my friend Ellen to uh, uh, talk a little bit about the different ways you can finance stormwater programs. Great. Thanks Ellen. very much, Sue. We can um, go ahead on to the next slide. So as we're looking at um, our financing strategies, we also need to think about <clears throat> what we're financing, right? So what are our needs in terms of what we need to finance? So we're gonna look at five different questions. What are your needs? What are those current and future costs? What are your current revenue streams? And you know, how much do you actually need in terms of financing? And what are the potential funding sources for that? Next slide. So, you know, when you think about your stormwater management needs, you may be thinking of, you know, these kinds of challenges around flood control and upgrading infrastructure and what might be happening uh, in the creeks and, and in particularly around erosion. Next slide. But there's a broader... Thanks, Sue. There's a broader set of activities that you do need to be thinking about. You may be looking at you know, putting in new capital improvements, whether that's gray stormwater infrastructure or green infrastructure. We've gotta be thinking about maintenance, which Sue mentioned. We got uh, in your MS4 permits, you also have to be thinking about what you need to do for public education. Uh, if you're gonna be putting in new projects, there's gonna be engineering and planning needs. You've got it, um, you know, filing annual reports, for example, with respect to regulatory compliance, administrative costs, and, and billing and financing. So you've got a big set of activities. You also have a set of partners you might be working with uh, in terms of doing some of that work. And I highly encourage you to think broadly and creatively about who can you can partner with, you know, particularly because those partners may be able to take, you know, 
manage some of those particular activities so that you will not need to finance those. And then you want to look at your um, you know, set of revenues. Next slide. So when you're thinking about those current costs and future costs, you, you do need to consider that both together in terms in order to be able to plan effectively. So you're going to be looking at those activities that are occurring on private land, you know, do you have new development coming in that you're going to have to be reviewing and inspecting and making sure it's working? Do you, ha you have those activities around um, in inspection and maintenance, whether that's looking at on private land or public land, and you've got regulatory compliance as well. Um, next slide, please. And those future costs, you need to be looking at what's happening with respect to the life cycle of those assets, whether that's gray infrastructure or green infrastructure over time, right? And the, when you first install them, they, those assets cost a bunch, right? Like you're putting in, you know, stormwater pipes and inlets, or whether you're, you know, putting in a rain garden, that initial phase is pretty expensive. But actually, the, the, for the life cycle costs, the majority of your costs are after you have put it in. Now, those costs occur over a longer period of time, but in total, that's more of your costs. So you do need to think about that in terms of life cycle and planning for the future. And those, you know, sort of spikes in timing when you're going to need a little bit of extra dollars because you got to do a little more than your regular maintenance to refurbish those, those assets. Next slide. And so that also should, you know, maybe have you reflect on whether you're going to be investing in new infrastructure or retrofitting in existing infrastructure. You know, sometimes new infrastructure can be higher upfront costs, but it may be more responsive to permit needs and it may be more responsive to your other community priorities beyond stormwater management. Sometimes it can be challenging though, if you wanna locate something on private land and you don't already have an agreement with that landowner. Retrofits can be pretty attractive because they can be lower upfront costs. You already have an asset, you know where it is, you know who you've been working with, you know, in terms of managing it. So you probably already have an agreement in place. But that retrofit, the value of that retrofit may depend a lot on where it is in its life cycle. If it's getting towards the end of its life cycle, that might not be a great place to invest. Um, so those are some things you need to consider in terms of the kinds of things you want to be investing in. Next slide. Then we want to look at our current revenue streams. And again, I encourage you to be really creative in thinking about what kinds of revenues are already coming into your municipality, your township, or your borough, and what you might be able to use to manage stormwater. And if you're thinking about this as managing stormwater around other community priorities, that'll help you expand, you know, the set of revenues you might be thinking about. So you, you know, most communities, when they put, filled out their TMDL plans and, and PRP plans said, we're going to be looking at, at general funds and grants. Um, but I encourage you to look, you know, at road maintenance. Road runoff is one of the challenges you're managing. Um, you could be looking at, pen, you know, at a loan from PennVest or from a bank. Uh, PennVest obviously has a lot more resources right now and uh, is looking to get more of those resources on the ground for, for green infrastructure. You might be looking at municipal bonds. You might be looking at fees, and uh, Sue and Paul are going to talk about that a bit more. Um, as I said, you'd be looking at grants. You might be looking at permit and inspection fees, right? So for particular activities that are occurring in your township, those that might be a source of revenues. Uh, you could be looking at shared services agreements, and I highly recommend that you consider these with respect to um, a variety of different kinds of activities, whether it's public education or maintaining your great green infrastructure. Uh, across public lands in your municipality. You might have two municipalities that can work together on that. And then other partnerships, particularly, we see this a lot around uh, the public education and engagement pieces, um, partnering with a local watershed group like, I don't know, Brandywine Red Clay Alliance or White Clay Creek Watershed Association can be a great way for you to meet some of the needs that you have for your stormwater management program. Next slide. And just to think a little bit more broadly about the grants that are available, I think a lot of you have know about Growing Greener and probably have accessed some of those funds, but there are other grants around in Pennsylvania that can be really helpful to you. So the Commonwealth Financing Authority has a couple of programs that um, specifically target flood control, for example. Uh, so that's something that you might wanna be looking at. Um, there's obviously the community re revitalization program in Chester County that can be accessed by the boroughs in Coatesville. 
There are community development block grants where you can look for public, you know, in terms of public works, and that includes stormwater infrastructure. And then there's, you know, my favorite program, uh, the Dirt and Gravel Low Volume Road Program, which provides matching grants through the Chester County Conservation District. And I really want to emphasize this because particularly this program also helps us fund road stream crossings. And you know, from what I saw in terms of the impacts of Ida and Chester County, I saw a lot of places where we had bottleneck flooding, flooding that occurred because of a road stream crossing that was not able to handle the volume coming from upstream. And so that's something to think about is, you know, right sizing those road stream crossings in a way that they can handle much larger storm events um, and using this kind of a resource to be able to get that work done. Next slide, please. And so I'm going to focus just a little bit more on road runoff because it is one of the things that you're managing in terms of your MS4 permit. Uh, and so things to think about with respect to road runoff management. I mean, these are, you're going to be managing that runoff to maintain your road anyway. So thinking about it in the context of your MS4 permit can help you. So that ma what matters is, you know, who's responsible for which roads. And given that, what kinds of uh, revenue and funding sources are available? Uh, do you have a partnership program that you can, uh, you know, work through. And if you don't have a partnership program, do you have, you know, would shared services agreements around BMP installation or O&M um, work for you and your community? So this can also uh, occur with respect to implementation of projects through the dirt and gravel low volume road program. You can partner with a municipality that already is certified to do that work and have them be, you know, sort of your person on the ground when those BMPs are installed. Next slide. So then you want to think about, you know, now you've thought about all your activities, current and future costs, so how much do I now need? So as you're thinking about how much you now need, you are thinking about, you know, what falls into these three buckets, the, you know, what you need to cover your staff, what you need to cover operations and maintenance, and what you need in terms of capital. Um, so there's also the timing element to this. The resources that you need may vary over the course of the year. You know, operations and maintenance, if you're doing maintenance on green stormwater infrastructure, those are going to peak, you know, sort of more in the spring and the fall. Um, likewise, if you're doing, uh, you know, installing BMPs, those things might, you know, those occur during particular times of the year. And then you have a five-year permit cycle, so you may be trying to get things done in a particular time period. So thinking about the timing of when you need those resources is important in terms of putting together that um, finance, the fi full financing picture. Next slide, please. And as you're putting that picture together, it's really important to also think about the costs of inaction, right? So like when you're thinking about your needs, you also wanna think about why those needs are really important and how you make that case quite frankly to your elected officials. And so some of that really, it does really help to think about the cost of inaction and you know, the impacts on public health and safety, increased flooding, repair costs, um, increased pollution that impacts recreational opportunities, you know, whether there's gonna be any legal ramifications with respect to flooding and those roadways deteriorating. And then, yeah, what are you gonna see around enforcement on the regulatory side? Next slide. So with all that in mind, you're gonna to put together that financing strategy um, to support the budget that you now have in mind in terms of the actual dollars that you need. So, you, you know, um, and you wanna think about what's the appropriate revenue stream for those activities as well. So general fund dollars are general, you know, good to look at in terms of covering staff time and engineering. Grants are more appropriate for demo projects and, you know, some stormwater management support depending on how large that need is, you're probably not looking at a situation where you will be able to fund all your needs through those two buckets, okay? So you're gonna to need to be, you know, being more creative. Partnerships can be really important. And then you might need to be starting to think about a fee. Next slide. And then, you know, so pairing up those multiple resources, those multiple sources of funding. Also keep in mind the multiple departments that, you know, might be, uh, that your municipality might be supporting and what role they can can fill both in terms of staff time and in terms of actual financing for capital improvements and pairing that up across um, departments and these multiple sources to put that financing strategy together. And with that, I think I am done and turning it back over to Paul and Sue to talk more about fees.
Great. Yep. Thanks, Ellen. Thanks. <clears throat> we are actually going to so, uh, issue can, another can poll. I, in, yeah. Sue, can I just interject? We did have a question for Ellen uh, <coughs> okay. on the chat. Uh, she wanted to discuss possible partners. And I just wanted to put in here CWMP.org has a list of grant and funding sources and all of the CWMP planning team. So um, often we, you know, we in the conservation organizations take a watershed approach. So you're, you may have a project that we've already identified an area for riparian buffers, green stormwater infrastructure, a stream restoration. So reaching out to one of the partners might be a good way to find out if your project might already be in a prioritized area. So I don't know if you had anything to add to that, Ellen. Yeah, I mean, I think you want to think creatively. So the Conservation District is always a great partner. Um, the watershed organizations are great partners. You know, so yeah, reach back out to Brian after this, Kristen. I highly recommend that um, because they can, uh, sometimes they can access funding more easily than a municipality can, depending on the kind of work that you might want to be doing. And then, you know, the public education piece, that's one of the wonderful things that CWMP does for all of you. They help out a lot with the public education piece. So maybe we can have a little bit more of a discussion offline about what are your particular needs in Cal Township and then, you know, how to fit you with a, a partner to help fit that need. Thanks. Great. So <clears throat> thanks, Ellen. And, and uh, also just pitching out, Peck, Peck also has some resources as well. But here's our question too, that we'd like to find a little bit out about your, uh, <clears throat> if you have a, if you're considering fees or maybe you're thinking about it or you need some more information, this again will help us a little bit in terms of uh, uh, <clears throat> some follow-up. Thanks for mentioning about PEC, uh, Susan. We've we were been able to partner with PEC on a few of the things, and uh, including that lawn to meadow workshop that's coming up on October 25. So that's an example of a place where we're reaching out and also willing to have residents, even businesses who want to come along to that workshop and learn about meadows. I would just mention too, just collaborating with other municipalities, and I'm not sure yes. mm -hmm. the status uh, in Chester County, but there are collaborate, you know, multi-municipal collaborations, and then we also try to work with large landowners that might be private that have land available and interested in engaging in, in a project for whatever reason. So those are some other examples of who you might partner with. Thanks, Paul. Right, Kennett Township and Kennett Borough partnered on a stream restoration at Nixon Park, and then recently Honeybrook Township and borough are working on some projects up there as well. So it, it does happen. So we got about 20 folks here on the poll. So I'm gonna close this so everybody can see it. Thanks, Brian. Can you see that? Mm -hmm. Oh, great, okay. Again, we have a little, a good mix here. So I see some are already in the process of adopting a fee. That's great. Um, and conducting the, re the, the actual, uh, feasibility analysis and even more interested. Great. Uh, okay. That's great to know. Thank you. Thank you all for responding. That's again, very helpful to our, our team here. Um, so uh, I'm going to just pick up right now to give you uh, 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 to sort of hone in on the stormwater, the stormwater fees as one of those many ways that you can finance stormwater management programs and some of the uh, you know, advantages uh, on, on establishing a fee program. But I, I want to start by uh, kind of a more of a high level overview of uh, stormwater fees and give you this sort of broader snapshot of what's going on across the country to let you know this is this is not uh, you know isolated. This is a very established practice across the country. Uh, we're we, uh, PEC does try to keep um, track of what's going on. Uh, yeah both across the country and also in Pennsylvania. Uh, and we have a, a great source for this information. It's the Western Kentucky University Stormwater Utility Survey. They update this every year, provides a lot of great information across the country, gives us a sense of what's happening uh, and what many of these fee programs, uh, what are sort of the average costs to, uh, uh, for example, so a, a residential uh, landowner. Um, but as you can see, there's many, many programs across the US and when we did the calculations, uh, essentially the average fee for stormwater programs um, sort of on a monthly base, basis ends up being around five 
74 a month. Uh, and for Pennsylvania specifically, a little bit higher, but but around the same amount, about six dollars and twenty cents per month. So this is just calculating uh, current uh, current programs in the in Pennsylvania. And speaking of that, here is a little chart where we, again we've been tracking the progress of implementation of fee programs across the state. Uh, and as you can see, um, uh, over the last ten years, there's been quite a, a, a growth in the adoption uh, in the adoption of stormwater fee programs in in our in our state. Um, we, we, you typically look at things um, as far as sort of early adopters um, and innovators as being about 2% of your total. And then as you move to this phase of early adopter, it becomes about 10, per, you know, you go from 2% to 10%. And you, so right now we have about 97 municipalities participating in a stormwater fee program. That represents about 10% of the total uh, MS4 communities in our state. We have about a thousand uh, that's currently uh, who are regulated under that program. So as you can see, it's picked up quite a bit. Uh, we know uh, working in Pennsylvania that municipalities are sometimes reluctant to implement new programs without, uh, they don't wanna be the first ones to try things. So we're seeing now that we do have lots of examples and we are actually, actually are gonna share with you a couple of case studies uh, where these fee programs are in place. And you're gonna hear uh, from, from, uh, from uh, one of those uh, boroughs, uh, uh, Westchester. So again, here's just again showing uh, the, the establishment of fee programs across our state. Uh, and you can see that they, it is kind of widespread uh, with, with uh, sort of centered around some of our more uh, urban areas. But again, this is, it, this is not concentrated in one particular area. It is where we are showing widespread uh, adoption of stormwater fee programs across the state of Pennsylvania. And uh, again, we try to keep track of this every year. And we didn't wanna leave out Delaware, uh, but Here's a couple of uh, pr uh, areas in Delaware that do have fee programs. Uh, you can see Lewes, Newark, and, and Wilmington. Um, those, the fee type, at least identified through that stormwater, the Western Kentucky uh, stormwater study. Uh, and Paul's going to be talking a little bit about this. Uh, for example, in Lewes, they use a fixed fee. Newark is based on something called an ERU, and you'll learn about that in just a second. And then Wilmington uses a tiered approach. Again, these, these are different types of fees that are implemented based on very specific characteristics of uh, the communities in which these fees are implemented. And that sort of leads to um, talking about why fees are something that you might want to consider. Uh, Ellen touched on this, but the fees are developed based on your actual costs and revenues. They uh, become a predictable stream for stormwater management improvements. Fees have to be uh, uh, directed to a very dedicated set of um, uh, uh, expenses and they have to be related to the to the to stormwater. Um, fees do apply across all properties regardless if they are taxable or non-taxable. Uh, so there becomes a little bit more uh, equity equity or, and fairness. Uh, fees are usually developed very specifically based on your municipal land use characteristics. Um, and uh, fees in Pennsylvania when implemented need to also include an offset or a credit program as well. So there has to be an opportunity for those that are subject to a fee to be able to earn credits um, for different types of practices. And we'll talk a little bit about that uh, as we move on today. Uh, just mentioning some of these really these technical considerations, uh, fee, fee programs and, and, and how you develop the fee are really based on a lot of very, very specific information uh, about a community. This is very critical in, in making sure that the fee is based on um, your land use characteristics, uh, your population characteristics, and what's going on um, uh, from a environmental standpoint. So we they look at things like land use, um, the relationship between you know pervious and impervious cover. The, uh, some of the, the fees also dive into things like hydrology and soil. So very um, very specific to a community. And this also helps in terms of developing one that you can, um, you know, you can share and, and uh, this information with your, with your residents and those that are gonna be subject to the fee and explain uh, how this process really does incorporate all these different characteristics and take into uh, consideration very specific um, municipal um, considerations. And another thing that I wanted to mention uh, before I turn it over to Paul is uh, this kind of question of, of equity or, or fairness. Again, stormwater fees are based on um, you, the amount of pavement you have. So the, the more you have, the more you will pay. Um, but there does 
need to be a, a credit program. And uh, many of the credit programs that we've looked at um, do provide an offset for that fee if you um, implement certain practices on your property. This could be things like green infrastructure, the rain gardens, green roofs, and things like that. And also these fees really do really look into your municipal characteristics so that you're not um, uh, unfairly uh, burdening uh, smaller property owners versus larger property owners. So there's a lot of that that really does uh, play into developing a fee. And there's many, uh, there's a number of uh, consultants out there that, that are, they specialize in, in developing these fee um, and doing these feasibility studies. So I'm gonna turn it over to Paul to talk a little bit more in detail about some of the basic ways uh, fees are developed. Um, right, I'll pick up here, yeah. Um, yeah. On this slide, I guess the, the most common approach has been this equivalent, equivalent residential unit, the ERU approach, which is basically based on the amount of impervious surface. So you've kind of gone at an out the financial analysis and you're really, you have a target amount of money that you're trying to raise through your fee. And then you're looking at your impervious surface that you have, the footprint of impervious surface, and you basically would develop, uh, come up with an equivalent residential unit, um, some fee per uh, square foot uh, value that would then be able to raise the money that you need to, to pay for um, you know, the service that you're trying to provide. So you kind of, uh, you pay, you pay is sort of the kind of the mantra. Um, and in this case, there's just an example showing the uh, a resident. If it's if one, it's just an example. And one ERU, let's just say it's a thousand square feet, and it's a dollar. So that a smaller property of uh, eight hundred square eight hundred square feet would pay a little bit less, and a little bit more, they'd pay a little bit more. So it's sort of uh, a way to set a standard rate. So that, that's kind of the most common approach. We have looked at all of the. Um, these 97 or so municipalities in Pennsylvania. And this is kind of the most common approach for setting the fee, the uh, equivalent residential unit. And then the next slide um, basically kind of reinforces that uh, a little bit, but that they also, you can also look at a tiered system. And I know West Chetra is going to talk the tiered system kind of um, retains the ERU for non-residential. So that's still applied, but for residents, they look at the tiered, so they might fit the, uh, the the properties into like zero to a thousand is one tier, or a thousand to fifteen hundred square feet is another tier. And I think the next slide sort of shows that example for Westchester. Um, and, and in this way, you're you're pretty much trying to uh, you look, look at the size of your properties and this, and uh, make an analysis for some of the smaller properties might be paying a little bit less. Um, the zero to thousand square feet properties are paying. Um, it's still based on the ERU, but it's based on the mid. Oops, the midpoint of the ERU. Oh, you're. <laughs> I think we're there. We go. So that this is this is sort of like the second most common. We see uh, ER the, the most straight pro, forward approach is used in the ERU, but then these tiered systems are also used, uh, focusing on the residential uh, land use and grouping the residential uh, properties into these specific tiers. And if it's non-residential, it just falls into the ERU approach. Uh, it's not really in the tiered approach. So I think Will will talk a little bit more about this as well. So that's you know just in a, a quick snapshot for approaching um, setting your fee based on an amount of pavement. Uh, the next slide that we had here is that we have got a couple of these presentations and we did do some case studies. We talked to a number of municipalities, we being Peck and Penn Future and American Rivers. We've done a couple of presentations so far and we called up and interviewed and talked to, uh, I guess, nine municipalities focusing on, you know, some key questions about how they approach the FS, their fee structure, their incentives and credits and their education and outreach. And I thought it'd be beneficial, you know, to share what your peers uh, have expressed in terms of um, they've got a fee and here's some of the things they've had to address. So. Uh, I just really lumped everything together. This is a big presentation lumped. So the next slide shows a very big overview of as with respect to the feasibility study takeaways. And you've already heard this already. It reinforces what Ellen was saying that municipalities are going to consider all the funding sources. It's not, it's not just a fee. There's like there's grants, there's loans, there's bonds, whatever else we can uh, access money. And then we're going to set a certain amount for the fee and then determine, you know, how to set that how to establish the fee across our, our, our land use pervious surface. 
Uh, you also, when you do your feasibility study, you've really got to figure out how is this going to work. You know, we're going to have to set rates and rules and a bill collection system. You really are required to have some kind of a credit. Uh, let if people do a project, they might be able to do the project in lieu of paying the fee. If there's always going to be an appeal process. You're going to have to have a way to financially manage uh, the fee program. Um, so these are just things that you would integrate into your into your feasibility study. And uh, the credit approach really is you want, you're going to be able to offer some credit, but there's also going to be a minimum amount of money you're going to have to still raise. So you kind of have to, typically there's like, uh, we're, we'll offer credits up to a certain percentage. And then after that, we really, we're, we're looking for revenue that we need here. So it's sort of a balance between what you need to collect and where you can provide credits. And then the last bullet there is that once again, that collaboration that came from the Wyoming Valley Sanitary Authority, where they looked at the cost of the municipality going alone versus the collaborating 31 of them. And there was considerable cost savings with, with collaboration. So um, the uh, next slide would be this free structure takeaway. I've kind of you know, mentioned this, the most common approach is uh, based it on impervious surface. You know, you, you might look at the cost of green versus gray um, or for credits, uh, consider it a tiered approach. You might adjust your, 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 your fee for smaller properties, lower income properties, possibly even for nonprofits. And, uh, and, and you might compare the fee to other funding options. The Capital Region Water did that and we're showing that, you know, if we go the fee approach, it's gonna be more cost effective than having a rate increase or, or taxes. These are, these are not taxes, these are fees. So that's something you might look at and, and to, to show that the fee approach is more cost effective than others. Uh, next slide. In terms of, in, of, of the credit programs, be very, um, like initially you might think, well, they put in a rain garden and I'll give them a credit and that's fine. And that's sort of is the most common, you know, you want, if they manage stormwater on their property, then they get a credit. But we noticed that some of the municipalities were thought a little more broadly about uh, maybe a stream buffer or down, down, downspout disconnect. If they have a large audience, if they're a church or a school that has a chance to do education and outreach, they could offer education outreach programs. They could reach a fairly broad audience and they could get credit for that. Some of the townships did that. Um, storm drain adoption programs, providing an easement if you're a property owner that can provide an easement that would enable a, a project. You know, there was credits. And then in the more agricultural oriented areas, there was, if you have a farm plan. So just think very broadly about the fee the credit program and that's what the municipalities were doing uh, in general and then the last uh sort of case study overview was um you can jump to to the education and outreach there was a lot of input on this and that is that you've got to do a lot of uh of, of pre and post if you're thinking about a fee you got to get out there um, and be prepared to do the outreach and then once there is a fee no matter how much pre-outreach you do, you're always going to people you're not you're going to miss. Not everyone's going to focus on it, and then you're going to get the fee and the bill in the mail, and you're going to have to have sort of a strategy for addressing the question that comes in about the fee. Engage your constituents, engage the elected officials, have them as uh, involved. Engage the landowners that are most impacted by the fee, and do as much diverse outreach as you can do um, uh, in terms of both pre and post uh, fee. And I had just had a couple more slides here on um, the fee development steps. This might kind of line up in your feasibility study. You, you do your feasibility study, the education and outreach required. This will require an ordinance. So you're going to have some, you're going to have to have political buy-in. There'll be an ordinance that will have to pass. You'll set up your billing system. You'll have your credit system. You need to maintain. Uh, there will be legal challenges, and we may hear a little bit about that. I think Westchester has some legal challenges, but in general, there, are, there could be some legal challenges and, um, and then, you know, imp implementation. So these are some general steps to follow. Um, other considerations is, once again, kind of repeating myself here, but emphasizing involving the community, have a steering committee, involve some of those, uh, you know, the folks that are most impacted. Um, some of the, the way you're you're talking about it uh, might might have an impact, like a st stream improvement fee might sound better than a stormwater fee, because um, that's really what it is. You're trying to improve the water quality of, of the stream, uh, and then getting involved. This question came up: uh, involve your uh, other NGOs, um, EACs, watershed groups, kind of get get as many partners involved um, as you can. 
And the next, uh, the P Penn Future has put together a whole uh, guidance document for how to develop an ordinance, the stormwater fee ordinance. So we wanted to let you know that that resource was available and there is that same list of things to consider in that. And then finally, the last slide I had here was um, just once again, very broadly, uh, you know, look for, get the community involved, look for local champions, look at what the priorities are in your particular municipality, really integrate this, look at a mixing of fin financing options, um, consider, you need to consider credits and um, basically look at who your different stakeholders are and how you can, you know, how you can work with different stakeholders and how they can contribute sort of the final takeaway and i i want to stop here um and that would be the we're we're, we're going to finish i think what we were going to do is have will go and then we were going to do a uh, kind of a, a whiteboard where we'll have you the audience uh state what their issues and questions are and have some conversation after will i think is what we wanted to do if okay. that sounds fine yeah so i'm going to stop sharing and let will yeah. bring these slides up okay <clears throat> While Will does that, Paul and Susan, there's a question in the chat maybe you could look at. This is about the license, having a license operators. Yes. Yeah. Um, I've, I've heard I've been hearing now more about sort of contractor certification programs for people that install green infrastructure. I think there was that that, that effort going on in the Chesapeake Bay to have some sort of a certification process. So um, I think that's what the, where the heart of the question. I don't know if Sue or Ellen has any anything to contribute, a license operator. Yeah, I mean, I, I certainly yeah. understand that's the way that we often um, there's certainly have those programs in place for operators of wastewater treatment facilities and drinking water treatment facilities. Um, so it does seem like the kind of thing that could evolve, but I have not heard of any kind of licensing program for stormwater managers at, you know, in any of the states that I've worked in. I don't know if Beth, when we get around to the DEP folks, maybe they will address that if they know of any kind of licensing programs for stormwater. Great, so we could pick that up uh, more with the Q&A period. Um, looks like Will's ready to go there. And um, Sue, do you think you could post that link to the guide from Penn Future in the oh, chat? Oh yeah, sure. Yeah, give me a second to do that. Yep, yep, yep. Awesome. I will do that in just a second. Okay, Will, all yours. All right, can you confirm you're seeing just the slides and not the PowerPoint? All right, cool. And I just realized, full disclosure, I am recycling presentations here. That's why it says October, 2021. Um, so I apologize for that. That's the one slide I didn't update for today. But, um, you know, there's there's a lot of interest in this. Our program is in its sixth year now. So we get a lot of, um, you know, a lot of interest and a lot of requests to speak about it, which is why I have the opportunity to recycle my presentation. But uh, again, my name is Will Williams, uh, Sustainability Director for Westchester Borough. Um, this is, uh, I'm sure most people on the call are familiar with Westchester Borough, but here we are um, at, from Google Earth. Um, we have a lot, we have all the challenges that our prior speakers mentioned uh, that municipalities are facing. We have frequent flooding events, specifically our Goose Creek, our section of Goose Creek. Um, there's really two places that get a ton of flooding. Um, they're both in low income neighborhoods. Um, so there's an equity component that we're trying to address. Um, we have, you know, Westchester is a very old town. We have ancient century and actually much older than a century storm sewer infrastructure, which we are now, I mean, we are just now beginning to wrap our heads around um, the extent of, you know, where they are, how old they are, the conditions. Um, we have 13 sections of pipe streams, which is exactly what it sound like. Um, you know, people came in thinking that they could uh, uh, outthink nature and, you know, build a, build a roof over a stream. Uh, might work for a couple of decades, and then you have 13 of them, which you need to repair. And, you know, their um, the roads have built on, been built on top of them. So that's a huge problem for us. 
this is really unique to you know more of your your boroughs and your cities but about 50 percent of our land area is impervious i'm guessing our surrounding townships that number is maybe 5 10 maybe 15 percent we're 50 percent impervious so there's just nowhere for that stormwater to go um, we have two impaired waterways, according to DEP at least. Uh, we have some pretty good research from our university that shows that our storms, our, our streams are not impaired the way the DEP thinks they are, but um, no sense arguing that to the DEP. Uh, we have budget challenges, like all municipalities, there's never enough money to do what you really need to do and want to do. Part of that, which is I think unique to Westchester, is a limited tax base. Um, I think I have further down in my slides, but one third of the properties in Westchester, not even one third of the properties, one third of the tax, the assessed value of the properties is not taxable. That's from university. We have a ton of county buildings and facilities being the county seat. We have a lot of churches and nonprofits. Those are, um, you know, and, and I just had this conversation about an hour ago with a resident. Uh, six years into the program, we're still getting uh, residents who, who don't like what we're doing. And, um, you know, they, they, they always come back to the tax versus fee question. And my response is, well, our position is that some of these entities that don't pay taxes, but put burden on municipal services, example being stormwater runoff, uh, should, should pay their share. Um, we are also happen to be arguing that in court right now. Um, so it's not necessarily the correct answer. Um, but we'll, we'll see soon. Um, and then obviously we have an increasingly complex regulatory environment, unfunded mandates, things along those lines. So we have a lot of issues. Um, it's also not totally doom and gloom. Some people enjoy our stormwater issues. These are pictures uh, from the vicinity of Westchester University taking during Ida. I apologize for the quality. We had to screen grab these off Instagram. So we have you know a guy diving headfirst into about, I mean, it looks like it's really flooded. That's still only about three or four feet deep. And then we have someone uh, swimming laps next to a parked car. Uh, this is obviously, it's, it's not all doom and gloom, but obviously some pretty scary stuff. So we always recommend that when you're doing this, you go feet first and you bring a flotation device. Um, so take this all together. Uh, what do we do? We, we created a stream protection fee. Um, Here's a sort of the background on that. Created a task force in 2013 of Borough Council to examine this. This was municipal staff, engineers, elected officials, residents. Uh, we looked at the needs of our infrastructure, the new regulations that were coming down the pike, what we need in terms of staff, maintenance costs, things like that, and basically put together a probable opinion of uh, engineers' probable opinion of costs for our stormwater management program. That came out to $1.4 million in 2013 dollars. Um, then we determined the impervious area. I think, you know, and this predates me by my many years, but, um, you know, they looked at different ways to structure it, decided that this was the, the fee for impervious was the most uh, equitable way to do it. Um, so determined the impervious area and then basically just solved for, you know, how much do you have to bill each square foot of impervious to get that $1.4 million. Um, this program was packaged up neatly and presented to council in December 13, 2013. If you'll see there, you'll note a three-year gap between the recommendations and approval by council. Again, this predates me. I think that is really, that comes down to the politics. Um, you know, the average fee, and, and this is our fee structure on the right here. The average fee for a resident for a, for a home is probably tier two or tier three. So, you know, eight to $12 a month. Um, that, uh, that's a significant tax increase. Uh, that's probably, and, an, you know, regardless of the fee versus tax question, let's forget about that for a second. Um, the, contribution of a household to the municipal budget. Let's just put it that way. Um, you know, I, I lived in the borough for 12 years. I was, a, my property was small, I was tier two. Um, that was, you know, like a 15 or 20% increase in what I was being asked to pay to the municipality in one year. When we do tax increases, increases we try to keep it to two, three, 4%. For me, as a smaller property, that was, you know, 15, 20% increase. So I think that's why we had that delay in three years. It was a question of, 
um, you know, are we going to fund this any other way? Are we going to move forward with the fee? And do we have the political will needed to make this tough decision and implement this program? Long story short, eventually it got implemented. 2017 was the first year we build. So we're now in our sixth year of the program. Um, it's assessed annually to every property that has impervious. Uh, there is maybe 12, 15 lots in the borough that don't have any impervious and that are not billed. They don't even get a bill for zero. Like they're just not in our system, which is one thing we have going for us as we argue in court that this is um, a fee, not a tax. If you don't have impervious, you don't pay. It's that simple. Again, you see, um, we went with a, a fee because you know, our, we needed those non-taxable entities to start contributing uh, to, to what we're trying to do here. Uh, on the right here is the language about what is eligible in the ordinance. It's uh, what we call a dedicated fund. Uh, the ordinance dictates what those costs can, uh, what those uh, dollars can be uh, used for. Uh, on the left, you have it in, in layman's terms. Here's what we're actually funding with this, um, with these dollars. Um, I mentioned earlier, we um, build out, <clears throat> we saw for 1.4 million, that's what we build out right now. Basically, um, roughly 10% of uh, the uh, property is, um, so this is our 2022 budget. You'll see it's, what I'm getting at is it's less than 1.4 million. We're not budgeting for the university to pay their bills. Um, that, that explains the discrepancy. But even with that, here's what our budget looks like for this year. The big green chunk there is new stormwater infrastructure. That is, you know, one very large project or maybe three smaller BMP projects. Uh, the smaller green slice is maintaining what we have, routine replacements, inlets, manholes, uh, all of our stormwater pipes. Um, outfalls, things like that, replacing things like for like with, with in-kind uh, infrastructure. In 2016, so prior to this program being established, we took out a bond. As part of that bond, we did a couple BMPs, put, you know, put them in the ground, more of like proof of concept stuff. This is the type of thing that we're looking to do with a permanent dedicated fund for stormwater management. Um, administrative costs, about 50 grand. That's um, it's basically half of a full-time position. And then I should have lumped these together, but you'll see there's printing postage refunds database. That's like our software costs. So in other words, our, our staff administrative costs and our, our administrative costs related to, you know, having a database, running a accounts receivable program come out to about $60,000. That's about 5% of the budget. I'm exceptionally proud of that. It has not always been that low. But um, I talked to the city of Honolulu a few months ago. They've had a program in place for a couple of years. They are spending 55% of their revenue on administrative costs. Uh, I tried very hard to get a job there, but they did not extend an offer. Um, but they were just kind of looking for um, ways that they could cut their administrative costs. Um, professional fees, that's, uh, oh, so we basically full cover a full-time position in public works. That's a really rough way of doing it, but we wanted to acknowledge that a lot of our public works personnel are spending time on stormwater issues. You know, there's no short of tracking every minute someone spends on stormwater. There's not really a easy way to do that. So we just said, we'll, we'll pay for one full-time position in public works. Um, professional fees are consultants and engineers. And then as you can see here, we have an exceptionally large legal budget that is entirely related to the university litigation. Um, so what we're doing with this money, um, here's some example of BMPs. Um, they don't all look this great. We've had, we have some good ones, we have some bad ones, and we have some really bad ones. Um, so, you know, what one of our lessons learned was just because you have a dedicated funding source doesn't mean that you're going to be excellent at, at maintenance. Um, our, our BMPs, most of them have been in the ground for three, four, five years now, and we're learning, um, you know, I heard a few months ago, this something that stuck with me that gray infrastructure looks best day one and then starts to sort of degrade from there. Green infrastructure looks best like year three or four if you're doing everything right. We didn't do everything right. We let a lot of our stuff go. And so now we're, we're basically, and a lot of our BMPs, our rain gardens, starting from scratch, landscaping them, trying to get them back to the design intent. Uh, so again, just because you have the money doesn't mean you're, you're going to have a, a successful maintenance program. You need a, a lot of in-house expertise or, or good consultants working for you. 
Um, and then this is an example of a uh, stream bank uh, uh, armoring, and we, we think of it as restoration, um, but uh, DEP doesn't see it as restoration. We're, you know, this is sort of old school. We're armoring and uh, shuttling water further downstream, but as you can see, we're about to lose um, someone's garage into the creek because of erosion and, and sedimentation. That's why, that's why we were a little ticked off. We didn't get credit for this. We're very much uh, did this to stop sedimentation in, in the stream, but um, you know it, it's it's sort of old school thinking, and that's why we didn't get credit for it. Um, so some of our challenges with our program um, litigation. I mentioned Westchester University has decided to challenge our position that it's a fee, not a tax. Um, that actually there was a, a hearing on that last week in front of the Commonwealth. Um, court. Uh, it's really not the university challenging it. It's the Pennsylvania, I forget what it's called, the, the State Office of uh, Higher Education, the, the group that runs all the universities. Um, but the state is worried about it. even though all of these regulations are getting pushed down from the state, the state doesn't want to pay for it, which means, you know, how many properties does the state own? Um, they ask us about roads. Like, what if what if PennDOT had to pay a stormwater fee on every road in Pennsylvania? That's what they're really worried about. They don't want the state to be subject, the state entity to be subject to the regulations they're putting down and, and the need to raise money. Um, so, you know, it's easy to blame the university, but it's really not coming from anyone on campus. It's, it's really above their, above their heads. Um, inflation, I mentioned, we're really feeling that the last year or two, the 1.4 million that we projected is just not going as far as we expected in 2013. So we're actively, you know, like really doubling down on trying to bring more grants in to help offset our costs for new infrastructure. Um, competing priorities for funding, there's always like pet projects of um, sort of like politicians wants things done in their backyards and, and or, you know, their friends stream is eroding their yard, you know, we get a lot of like, not so great um, influence on, on how to spend our money. You know, it's not always based on like best engineering practices and priorities. Um, public expectation has been huge. Um, I wasn't here for the launch of the program, but I can tell you just for, again, had a conversation today with a resident who's not so pleased about this program. Um, that's still going on in year six. So there's the unpopularity of rolling it out, but then there's this expectation of, well, I'm paying this, you need to come in and solve all my problems. That's where we get the pressure to do kind of like dumb projects that don't serve a lot of public good. They don't get PRP credit, they don't mitigate flood, but maybe they prevent someone's, um, you know, uh, hostas from, from getting swept away in the next storm. We get a lot of pressure and expectation that we're gonna do now that people are paying into this, that you know, there's some person that we've now taken liability for all stormwater issues in the borough. So we have to push back on that. And, and the best means we have to do that is to establish a really good pipeline of projects. And then when we get that public pressure to do things that aren't really wise investments, we go to our elected officials and say, okay, if you wanna do this project, which serves no public purpose, what are you willing to take out of the project pipeline, which is a really good investment of these public dollars? You guys are the elected of fo folks. You tell us what to do. Um, but, you know, there's there's always issues related to that. Um, maintenance, I mentioned, just because you're building things, you know, I always say that every new uh, BMP project we build means our budget is going to shift from capital heavy, like the maintenance sliver of that pie is going to grow. And we're going to have less and less money to do new infrastructure. Another reason why we need to go after grants and probably think about raising the fee uh, from time to time to um, combat inflation. And then, you know, of course, regulations. We never know what's coming down the pike next. We just went through the process of updating our stormwater ordinance. You know, that, that guidance was published in June and we had till uh, to next week to do it. Um, that gave us really like two monthly meeting cycles to push, you know, like over 100 changes to a stormwater ordinance, you know, past our, our elected officials. So there's always going to be that like keeping up with the new regulations as they roll down the pike. Um, so that's all I prepared. I'm happy to answer questions. Great. Um, hey. So 
Paul, did you want to launch the whiteboard now? Yeah, hey, is that, do we have time? Yeah. yeah, yeah. I'm sure, yeah, I'm, uh, yeah, sure. I, I'm, all, I'm for, if you guys are on oh. board, I think we should, you know, try to get a quick snapshot on concerns and questions that we have the time to do it, yeah. Yeah, sorry, I didn't mean to jump yeah. in there. Yeah. Brian, do we have time? Yeah, I think we should. Yeah, let's take yeah. a few okay. minutes to see what yeah. the questions are. And I think the whiteboard is a way for everyone to see them in one place. Hey, so sorry. Uh, I'm an attorney by training, Will. So having a little chat back and forth in the chat here. So I didn't realize the university actually does have its own MS4 permit. Mm -hmm. So was their fee discounted for the MS4 work that they've done on campus? Um, they haven't done much work on okay. campus. Um, and, and this is something that came up in one of the judges at the hearing last week asked about it. Um, and I get what they're after, you know, if, yeah. if they have their own MS4 and, and right. own responsibility, then, right. then it's not really fair if they're paying into another MS4. The problem is um, they have their own MS4 permit. They do not have their own MS4, really. Um, our storm sewer goes crisscrosses their campus. Um, you know, it's our pipes, it's our inlets. Right. Um, we maintain them, we clean them, we replace them when they break. Uh, we are installing that stream armoring project that I showed was about 100 yards down from where the entire North Campus flows into one creek. I mean, it's acres and acres of a concrete going into a stream that is right. one foot deep when it hasn't right. rained in three days. Right. Um, so our position is, even though they have a permit, they really don't have any infrastructure and all of their infrastructure drains into our gotcha. storm sewer. Um, and, and I think our, our solicitor did a good job of pointing that out and they were asking about other municipalities and I get what they're after. So you can't ask Phoenixville to pay a stormwater fee to Philadelphia, even though they're both on the Schuylkill River. But the difference is Phoenixville is discharging the Schuylkill River and so is Philadelphia. Westchester University is discharging into our storm sewer. Right. They don't have any outfalls in any waterways. Um, so our, and, and you know, the, to illustrate that, so it's a hypothetical, obviously we wouldn't do that, but if, you know, what would happen if we went down and filled our storm sewer on campus with concrete? Right. Um, would that impact what they're doing? Would the cost of rectifying that be more than their annual fee times some number of years? And the answer is yes. Um, they're, you know, the damage they would sustain from a one inch rainstorm would be a hundred times more than their annual stormwater fee. Um, so those are the things that we're trying to uh, demonstrate to the, to the judges. But the other weird thing about this, if I can entertain you for another 30 seconds is it's the Commonwealth court being asked to decide this issue between the Commonwealth and yeah. the borough. Yeah. <laughs> we don't we don't feel that that's an objective venue for for we we feel that it should be like looked at from from another state's third party objective opinion. Yeah, uh, yeah it's not really a fair venue for us. Yeah. It does Are seem we... like a situation that's ripe for negotiation between the two entities to yeah. And, and that's the other thing that bugs us. You know, we have a credit program. It's very generous. It's too generous. Like we're, we get money away from the program for things that are required in new construction. Um, I, I think that's way too generous. It's like you meet the law and you get, um, you know, a huge discount on your bill. That's, that's not really right. Um, they have not opted to like, they could very, substantially reduce their bills if they entertain the credit program. But like I said, it's not it's not really about the university in this program. Yeah. It's about a precedent for all state entities, you know, being subject to these type of fees. Ellen, can I, it's not, um, maybe you, I, I don't know how different it is for in Philadelphia with um, say um, Penn or another university um, yeah. and how that stormwater fee works. Um, so it's very different in Philadelphia. So there are a gazillion university campuses, none of them have MS4 permits. And one of the because of the CSO? We, yeah, we, it's because of the okay. CSO. So okay. the challenge for Philadelphia is trying to get those campuses to do stuff. And so I very much appreciate that the university does have an MS4 permit because it should push them to actually do some work. And it gives you some leverage, Will, right, to have that conversation. Mm -hmm. It's very challenging in Philadelphia. You know, the, what you have to go on with those campuses is basically, you know, you should do the right thing. So it's a moral conversation, you know, about mm -hmm. morality as opposed to about 
you know, the impacts that they're actually having on the system. I, I would just ask, is there, I want to make sure if there's anybody has any just sort of comments or questions. I know we, we're probably taking up more time than we should be, but it, feel free to use that whiteboard if we don't, you know, and uh, you can post your sticky notes. Yeah, if people are, if, you, if you're not familiar, you can just, you just hover over the sticky note, pull it, you know, and then it'll let you, um, you can, you know, put your comment in just like that. And we can all see it. So that's, yeah. yeah. So if, if yeah, and I, I'd ask this question in the chat. So if you are using your ARPA dollars for either project implementation or to leverage as, you know, match for grant funding, it'd be great to know that and have a better sense of, you know, who's doing what and kind of the creativity that's occurring across the county from the municipal, you know, use of those dollars. I think we're seeing a, a comment coming. <laughs> A good question for Paul. Oh, yeah, maybe. I think that's uh, that would be the I think the Wyoming Valley Sanitary Authority. Um, they have the 31 municipalities, and um, I don't know the exact. I forget to the exact percentage, but they each of them do does get a percentage of the uh, of the feedback to to spend on their own programs, and then the sanitary authority then is also going to collectively determine where to do, you know, GS, where to do projects, you know, where the, where's the best location site. So there's, so I say some of the money is being spent sort of more broadly where project opportunities exist, but there is a certain percentage too. I think it's 10%. Yes, it's 10 yeah, they, they get a 10%, yeah. Yeah. they call like a municipal savings fund that, that, yeah. that uh, they get from their, uh, the, the full fee that's collected from their community. And then they get to spend that in uh, any way they'd like related to stormwater management. So I, I think the example was that Wilkes-Barre had about 1.2 million per year. So they would get 120,000 in, you know, funds that they can use for uh, local projects. So yeah, it's an it, it was an interesting way to um, uh, make sure that the communities had, had, had some control of those fees that were being collected. And it's a really um, good, good use of that partnership, right? To use an existing administrative structure Yes. For getting the fee, you know, like for doing, getting fee notices out and all that kind of stuff. So that's, you know, another thing to be thinking about is who else can you partner with for those kinds of activities, those um, administrative billing activities. Right. In that, in that case, the authority was an established sanitary authority. They elected to take on the role of a stormwater authority and that they had all of those sort of administrative processes already in place. So it was, in, you know, easy for them to set up the the billing and the on the uh oversight so yeah, yeah. As, as ellen mentioned if, you, if you're using the authority approach for the fee program then th that that's one possible um way to uh uh to think about a fee program yeah. it right. doesn't they, actually have to just be a, an authority so if your township just provides wastewater services through yes. a public works mm -hmm. department but even if it's an authority structure, you maybe and you don't want to do your fee through an authority, you could still, you know, seek a shared services agreement with them to put the fee on their bill and have them manage that that element of the um, stormwater program. Thanks, Ellen. I think that sort of goes to this fact that there's a lot of different ways, little flexibility in that, and it, it, you should explore all those different options. Right. Yeah, which also means you could do it with a drinking water system. Yeah, too. exactly. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And part of our case studies, I didn't share the slide, but they did show the the, the savings that in Wyoming Valley. There was a considerable savings in, by by collaborating, and they had a slide that demonstrated that. Is that I didn't I didn't have time to show. Um, there's a question here about wastewater systems where the stormwater boundary is similar. I'm not sure to the wastewater boundary. What who asked that and what what. So that was just me, okay. just, you know, getting folks to think about if you do have a wastewater um, system, you know, if it's, if the boundaries for that system service area are similar to your municipal MS4 boundaries, then that might be a good opportunity for collaboration. So um, for the sake of time, I'm going to see if I can keep the whiteboard up. I don't know if I can do that while I share the screen with Sunah. 
we have an update from the um, Chester County Act 167, and then uh, we have folks from PADP on the call. So I want to make sure we have time at the end of the call for them. So uh, Suna, you're up next. Can you share the screen while the whiteboard's on? I can. Let me try. Um, let me see if I can. No. Okay. So if you have any additional questions, go ahead and use the chat. And uh, so now you're free to share now. And then uh, Beth and Ricky will we'll save some time here at the end of the meeting for PADP. Hold on one second. I didn't want to do it that way. Okay. So everybody can see my screen now. Yes. Good morning, everybody. Um, and I'll be on um, with Chester County Water Resources Authority. Um, and as you know, we've been doing an um, update to our integrated, the countywide integrated water resources um, plans, which includes, it's not scrolling, okay. Um, which includes the countywide Act 167 stormwater management plan, um, as well as our watershed, um, a watershed plan. Um, so um, as Will mentioned, um, in terms of the updating the stormwater ordinances, um, Chester County had developed um, a model stormwater ordinance as part of its 167 stormwater management plan. Um, so it's an addendum to, to that plan. Um, so the, the county commissioners had adopted the, the updated ordinance um, back in February, and then based on DEP um, review comments, we had to make uh, some additional changes. Um, and so um, in August, the commissioners readopted the ordinance. Um, and at this point, we've, we've um, handed that over to DEP for final review and approval. So we're waiting on that. Um, and in terms of MS4 requirements, the MS4 municipalities are, are expected to update their ordinances by the end of this month, so September 30th, 2022, unless your permit says otherwise. Um, I know there are a number of municipalities that um, have different deadlines to update their ordinances. Um, but once we, the county gets approval from DEP, the rest of the MS4s and non-MS4 municipalities um, are required to adopt the model ordinance within six months um, of that approval. Um, and that, that falls under the Act 157 stormwater um, management regulations. Um, so just, um, we have all our resources for the stormwater ordinance updated onto our website. So at chesto.org forward slash stormwater ordinance. So that includes the ordinance um, and any supplemental documents, um, and uh, ad some additional resources as, as well. Um, and so the Act 167 stormwater ordinance and the plan are integrated into our watershed 2045, which is the countywide comprehensive plan. Um, and we've been doing this update over the last few years, um, getting public input um, and date doing data collection, working with our steering committee, and we started actually drafting um, the text and doing some modeling. Um, so our next year in committee meeting is scheduled for October um, of next month. And then um, our consultants are working on, our, on um, the model results for the plan. And then we're expecting to have a draft um, at the end of 2022. Um, so that's where we are. I'm hoping that we will have a draft, um, but it's probably gonna go into 2023 and then we'll, We'll um, have some public meetings and get some input um, and hopefully finalize that by the end of 2023. Um, I just wanted to give an update on um, county ARPA funding. Um, and I, so the county commissioners met on, on Wednesday um, and actually approved um, the, the, the applications for um, the ARPA funding that they were, they were um, giving out. So the, originally the county was awarded 102 million when they opened up the application um, applications, um, they received over 300, requesting over 300 million. Um, and that's not just um, water infrastructure, um, it's, a, it's the whole range of ARPA um, categories. 
So um, they ended up approving about 70 recommended applications, and I don't know the total dollar amount, but if you go to their website, um, the website tesco.org forward slash ARPA, there's an, they actually, there's an update on the website and there's actually the list of awarded applications. Um, and there are, def there's probably, there are a number of stormwater infrastructure ones, um, probably about maybe 10 of them that may have been awarded, um, but not more than that. Um, and some of them include um, some basin retrofits as well as um, some, a stream restoration project. Um, but the but the details of, of the funding um, haven't been quite worked out yet. Some of the some of the applicants had to ask for full funding or partial funding, um, and the county didn't originally require a match. Um, but they're going to go back to the applicants and ask for more match in some cases. So, and if anybody has any oh, and just so you, on that website, there's a there's also a map showing. So this isn't where the projects necessarily are. It's the location of where, of um, where the applicants had, um, where the applicants are from. So, and, and there's also a distribution of, of the different types of projects um, on the website as well. And if anybody has any questions, feel free to email me um, at, at water at And that's all I have. Thanks, Sunaw. Any questions for Sunaw? Either in the chat or just unmute yourself. Thank you. We we appreciate the uh, the update. Uh, we have some time now, as we always do. For uh, I'm going to uh, turn it over to Beth and Ricky. Did you have anything that you wanted to present? Uh, from Pennsylvania DEP Southeast region. Hi, Brian. Uh, no, I, I don't have a formal presentation prepared. It was my hope to just go through some updates for the program and then um, open the floor to any questions folks may have. That sounds great, thank you. Okay, so I, I guess without any further ado, I'll start off by um, a quick virtual introduction. Um, I'm joined today by Ricky Carter. Ricky is our new Environmental Protection Compliance Specialist, and he's filling the role that uh, Krista Brown previously held. Um, you folks will be seeing Ricky within the next five years. Uh, DEP has resumed post-COVID doing in-person MS4 inspections. Uh, so we're required to do that once during the permit term. And we view these as a valuable opportunity to get to meet folks face-to-face, -face, um, give you some feedback on your program just so you municipalities, you don't feel that you're, you're spending money and you don't get any feedback from the state one way or the other. So we will be reaching out. It is annual report season. We will be reviewing your annual reports. Uh, what I would ask folks, if you haven't submitted your report yet, uh, please consider doing so electronically. We, we don't necessarily need hard copies. So if you would like to use our on-base system to upload your report, we would certainly welcome that. Um, I guess to get to one of the questions before I forget that came up during the presentation. To my knowledge that there's no initiative going on on the part of the state to license GSI installers or inspectors. Um, if that is something that folks are interested in, uh, perhaps reach out to our central office to, to see if there's any movement on that front or that's something that can be, I guess, gotten off the ground. Uh, the other update I have, and, I, and I'm not sure how much this affects municipalities within this watershed. I think you're all mostly individual permittees, uh, but there was some new information posted to our website this morning. And basically, if a municipality is covered under the PAG 13 general permit, uh, you don't need to submit an NOI notice of intent at this time. There's been a two year pause placed on that. Reason being that uh, there needs to be some more work done on the part of the department to nail down permitting requirements for the next permit term. And with that said, there also hasn't been a decision made yet as far as what the individual permittees will be responsible for moving into the next permit term. 
So I'm sorry, I don't have more details on that front at this time, but the best advice I could give is keep an eye on the website. You know, if you have any questions, certainly feel free to reach it out to me or any of my staff. Ricky, is there anything you, you wanted to add? Say hello to the group. Uh, no, I guess, yeah. Um, you know, if you guys have any questions about anything, just shoot me an email or a call. Um, yeah, I'll be reviewing all your annual reports as they come in. Uh, so just have some patience. <laughs> don't, don't worry too much if you don't hear from me right away. Uh, we'll get to them all. Uh, but otherwise, not, I don't really have too much to add, Beth. Okay, thanks, Ricky. R Ricky's an army of one right now. <laughs> So he's, he's going to be um, reviewing the reports, as he mentioned, and, and he'll, he'll be the face you see for the MS4 inspections. So I guess with that said, does anybody have any questions for us? Hey, Beth, this is Ellen. Yeah, I got a question for you. So we do have a lot of individual permittees, and the, the permit itself, I believe, is supposed to expire next year. But a lot of the folks in this watershed have TMDL plans or PRP plans that may not have been approved, like that weren't approved and in place for that permit term. So any update on what's gonna happen with respect to that? Sure, and thanks, Alan, for your question. Uh, we are continuing to work on the permit backlog we have. We are aware that we have many permittees, individual permittees especially, um, who haven't gotten their permits yet. And we're doing our best to work with those municipalities and consultants to try and get those over the finish line. So we thank everyone for their patience if they haven't gotten their permit yet. Um, it, we're hoping that we're getting into the home stretch with these things. I think we've reached a point where the mapping is correct for most of these permit applications. And once that happens, things really seem to fall into place. So I guess, to jump ahead a little bit, as we issue these permits, and I think this was mentioned elsewhere during today's meeting, those permits will have their own individual schedules in them for compliance. Um, so for example, if a municipality received its individual permit today, they would then have five years from the date of that permit to implement the TMDL plan or PRP. Okay, that's really helpful. So going forward, we're gonna have very staggered dates across this watershed. Yeah. for their for the various municipalities in terms of their MS4 compliance. Correct. Okay, great. Thank you very much. That's really helpful. Mm -hmm. My pleasure. Hey, hi, Beth. This is Sue from Peck. Uh, just following up on Ellen's question. I, if I'm understanding correctly, then if you already ha did get your permit approved, you would it automatically renew in, in March of 2023? Or is it just how, how is that going to work with those that actually did have, have received their permit? So approved. this is a little complicated to say the least. So for, <laughs> for most of the members of this group, they're individual permittees. So their renewal date is individualized based right. on the date that DEP issued the permit. So basically that renewal term is five years. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, for, for, for the general permittees, which again, I don't think really applies a whole lot, if at all here, um, there's a two-year hiatus on submitting a notice of intent, although I would point out that the schedule for implementing the PRP does not change. Okay. And again, there's more details. I apologize. It, this just got posted this morning. It, it's fleshed out a little bit more on our website. So that's, I guess that generally means, it, I guess it basically means you're administratively extending the existing general permit. Correct. I think you could yeah. say that. Yeah. Okay. Thanks. That, that, this is really helpful. I, I appreciate that update. And I'll check sure. out the website. <laughs> I think what may also be of interest, now granted, this is a, a work group for the PAG 13 permit, but we do have folks across various disciplines here, watershed groups, municipal officials, um, consulting engineers. There's also a solicitation for folks to join a PAG 13 work group, I guess, to help shape what that next permit will look like. Um, so if, if that's something that's of interest to anybody on the call, certainly throw your your name in the hat and see what happens. Great, thank you. Any, sure, my pleasure. Are there any other questions?
Beth, this is David Ross. If a, if a municipality had received a waiver uh, mm -hmm. and then needed to apply as the five-year anniversary of the waiver was arriving, is that also caught in that um, hiatus? Uh, so if the municipality received a waiver and that waiver expiration date is coming due, we would ask that they resubmit the waiver request. In fact, we have a few of those pending in our office right now. Thank you. Yeah, great question, David. <laughs> Thanks. Absolutely. So Beth, this is Sana. I'm wondering, so for the way, for those municipalities who may have gotten a waiver, um, or additional municipalities who were non MS4 holders um, or MS4 permittees um, that now may be in the urbanized area based on the new 2020 census data? Mm -hmm. Or they or, or is DEP basing it still back on, well, I can't remember what year it was, the 2014 maybe, or the 20, 2010 um, urbanized areas. Um, are they, is DEP basing the, the next round? Um, on 2020 urbanized areas. So, so for those municipalities who may have gotten a waiver, non-MS4 non municipalities who are now would fall under an urbanized area, um, would they need to uh, um, apply for permits? Not necessarily. Uh, what we will do is if the municipality wants to reapply for the waiver, uh, they can certainly submit that application and we will look at it in comparison with uh, current guidance. It's not necessarily a given that they're going to be required to do a permit during this cycle. The, the criteria have changed slightly, um, but I, I guess for, for lack of a better way of putting this, if you got the waiver last time it, it, and you now have more urbanized area, it's not necessarily a given that, that you're going to get a permit this time. Okay. I would say for any folks on the call who represent municipalities who are asking for a waiver, um, just check in with me on a one-on-one -on -one basis and I can give you some better project specific information. Thanks, Beth. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Anything else for Beth? I would. I was just going to add. Maybe this is probably. A, maybe I'll have to give you a call, Beth, because I'm really interested in knowing. I know there's a five-step process for getting a waiver, and I think that we, were, we Sue and I were trying to figure out what, like, what PADP considers to say, like, in terms of you know preventing future degradation. Is there any kind of modeling or what actually happens beyond the? But I think this is too big of a topic for today. But if I could call you up and ask ask you about it. <laughs> Uh, we were want, we were interested in that question. Yep. Sure. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. yeah definitely. That was, yeah. <laughs> Thanks, Paul. We were thinking exactly the same thing. With respect to legislation yep. is out there. So. Right. Right. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Beth, do you have any updates about any funding that might be coming through PADEP that could be specific? That's I shouldn't say could be, that is looking to be specifically targeted at supporting MS4 communities, whether it's through ARPA or the infrastructure funding or anything like that, or the new legislation at the state level? That is a great question. Um, unfortunately, I don't have a lot of details at my fingertips okay. other than I, I probably know as much as anybody else or maybe even less than on this call. I have heard that there may be some money coming through PenVest for stormwater infrastructure. Uh -huh. Um, our Growing Greener Grants program is something that it's a long-term existing program that I right. know that a lot of municipalities have used to fund BMPs. Um, beyond that, I, I'm not hearing much, but that doesn't mean that there's okay. nothing out there. Okay. Yeah, I just was wondering if there was anything new. So it sounds like not not at the moment. Yeah, nothing to announce at this point. Okay. I, 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 heard, I also heard that there may be some um, 167 funding coming down, um, and, and I'm wondering if that... So for, for um, Chester County municipalities who, who adopted the updated um, stormwater ordinance, would they be able to get reimbursed under the 167 funding um, for adopting that ordinance? So any, any money that they spent um, updating their ordinances? So that is an excellent question. I have heard that there is a pool of money that, that's being set aside. However, I don't have any updates on how that's going to be dispersed or spent. Um, I hate to keep telling people to check the <laughs> website, but we, we do have an Act 167 page on the DEP website, and that might be your best 
place to go okay. to for updates. Great. So thank you, Beth, for, for joining questions? us. Sure. And I thank you, Brian, for allowing us to be here. And thank you, folks, for your time this morning. I want to thank uh, Paul and Susan and Will, Ellen, for your presentations. Um, very informative. Uh, really appreciate the, uh, the hands-on experience that, that you bring to us, the actual real-world experience. That's great with the study and Will. Uh, being willing to talk about how things go at Sboro. Um, we are working with it. Will. One of the things we want to address in 2023 is the maintenance issue. So look for a, a series of workshops on rain garden maintenance that we're working on for 2023. And then October 25, we're going to um, have that uh, lawn to meadow workshop. So if you're considering or have residents considering a lawn to meadow, you know, we encourage you to come along to that workshop. It's going to be hands on. Um, so uh, and then this uh, recording will be posted on cwmp.org so that you can share it with others. Um, we're uh, four minutes over time, so I want to just uh, respect everyone's time and uh, conclude the meeting. And thank you all for coming. Uh, and always reach out to your CWMP partners if we can help in any way. Hope everyone has a great weekend. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Brian. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, everyone.